Hello there folks and welcome to the stream. My name is Mike D'Angelo aka That Telus Guy. Today we are going to be taking a deeper dive into the world of Telus by way of the races of Telus. Um, we've seen a decent amount of them throughout many of the stories, sometimes just glimpses here and there. Uh, one of the things that we have lucked out on is we have a couple of artists who we've collaborated with over the years who have made some awesome design choices for us and things like that. Um, we're going to just kind of crank them out. Uh, there's like 16 or so of them across the goodly and evil quote unquote races. Um, of course, that's a subjective term. There's uh, there's shadow and light in every race on Telst. Just because someone thinks that someone is bad, that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. Um, but, uh, but we'll kind of cross that as we get there. So probably first and foremost, you'll know that uh, the humans are probably the most prevalent race that we talk about. We have a lot of uh, series leads in the Telus universe that are humans. A lot of that is because I'm trying to find the human element in a lot of the stories that I write. And it's, easy, it's an easy place to start from. Um, I'm often trying to look at some of the things that might be happening in real life to sort of like shine a mirror onto. Um, there are prejudices in the Telus universe just like in, in the real world. Um, and that sometimes means going to and exploring places that don't look kindly on people that don't look like everybody else and some of those cases the countries and kingdoms they've even gone so far as driving the other races out um for instance a bit of the mythology from the april's fools references the minotaurs being driven into the sea but by the black lanean army um black lane just historically does not like anyone that's not a human so they've done a lot of rotten stuff over the years and that's to the detriment of this lovely culture blend that you might see. Um, in Argos, actually, no one but humans are typically seen in the main city. Um, the the king of Argos has a friend in Icarus Kalatuil, who's an elf, who features in a couple of other stories that we've written. Um, but he's nowhere near the main city. Um, and as cruel as all that is, those places are not the paragons of virtue that we expect to see and embrace. Instead, places like Adalatha, for Cynthia, and Searchlight... They offer up the kindness and openness that makes for a beautiful blended culture amongst many people. Humans are usually considered the standard race in Telus. Their connection with uh, the strain, which is the magical permutation that sometimes affects some people in the world, that's the archetypal style that you'd normally see in many of the other races. There's some twists and turns that I'll explain in a little bit. Um, 
but we'll we'll get to there when we get to there. Um, some of the notable human heroes are Adelia Cregan, who you can see here. Actually, let me see. I might have even done some prep work. There we go. So we've got Adelia Cregan. Um, we've got Kelvin Dracos. This is a young version of Kelvin from the Silver Serpent series. And we've got uh, Maximus Sanders, who is the lead hero from the Tinker's Tale series. Uh, the next one that we'll talk about is the Elves of Telest. So I'll jump into a picture of Awake. Uh, the main character here is an elf, and we'll kind of dive into her story a little bit uh, later. But uh, the Elves of Telest, they're known for their shared abilities when it comes to the strain. So um, really, they're known for one terrible event. They banned humanity from Telus for millennia, and because of that, magic became unstable. Um, even after humanity returned to Telus, the elves were never really able to retrieve their power, not the way that they once had it. Instead, the elves now share their abilities amongst their tribes. Um, if a tribe once had the ability to teleport freely amongst the world to anywhere that they had before, um, you know, without any restrictions or anything like that, they can now only do it twice per day. Those who could summon ethereal wings to their backs, uh, you know, without any reprieve, or limitation, they have to carefully think about how long have I worn these wings, otherwise I'm going to fall from the sky and potentially kill myself. Um, the Elves are usually the second most prevalent series leads that we see. Um, the most notable is right here, we've got Vanatherin. Um, we've also got Icarus, who we mentioned before, in a couple of places. Um, so Icarus is an elf who survived since the days of old, and Many of the people in Telus blame him for the events of the fall. Um, if you've read the fall, you know that that's not entirely true. He, uh, he did his best to prevent it, but such things don't always work out for the best. Um, and then we also have kind of subsects of elves as well. Um, and these include dark elves known as Delvers. Uh, we've only really seen one Delver in the Telus universe so far, and that is Ileana. Who, uh, she was a lead character in... Um, Lord of Thunder, and if you look, you can actually see her on the cover, so she made the cover. Um, so, we definitely have some, some elves that have their chance to shine and things like that. Uh, thus far, not the lead of any of their own uh, novels or novellas or anything. We do have some dwarves who've shown up from time to time. Um, let me see if I have... There we go. So, when the dwarves in Telest present with the power of the strain... They're expected to create a clan based on their powers. Uh, members of their former clan are meant to help them create the new clan. So, for instance, in the Tulse novel, The Enemy Within, Miter Coldwessel ended up developing a power in kind of the opening of his story. And because of that, some of the dwarves that he was with, he was just a miner. He wasn't, you know, anything special. There was no royal blood or anything like there. Um, but because of his his status, all of a sudden, people swore fealty to him, and they called him, uh, I believe it was Miter Earthshaker, because he had, you know, like the ability to move the rocks without his pickaxe or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, some, some of the notable dwarven heroes besides um, uh, Miter are Doran Thunderfury, who is Bolt Thunderfury's dad, Ilva Coldwhistle, Volan Lightfoot, and Calder Coldwhistle. Um, a couple of these dwarves have had their chance to shine in stories that uh, Rihanna wrote. Um, at some point, we're going to uh, sum up a trilogy for the Coldwhistle clan, and we might even bind that together into one book so that you can get all those stories in one place and have, instead of having to uh, get them across multiple Tales of Tellist uh, books. So... One of the things that you won't see on the TELUS website uh, too much is we don't have anything for the gnomes in the art gallery. We do have, uh, in a couple of places on the TELUS website, some gnomes in like the sprite art from the, the Quantum Quest games and things like that. And certainly we have some of them featuring in the novelization. So we have um, Urabar Reese, who is this guy here, and we have... Barris Ames, this one here. Here's a better picture of Urubar, a little blown up. Uh, they both feature in the novelization, so you'll be able to get to see them shine. Um, we also have Merle from Heart of the Forest, who we don't have any art for him or anything like that, but he'll feature 
a little bit more prominently in the second Heart of the Forest book, so you'll be able to kind of follow along with another cool gnomish character. Um, one of our more prevalent recent gnomish characters is actually a half gnome. She's a uh, the product of a gnomish father and an elvish mother, um, Kyra Jesselwaite from D. April's Fools. She kind of shows what happens when a gnome, um, you know, is born of a of an elf, and that's they present with aberrant strains. So, for instance, Kyra's mother had water based powers. You know, she could kind of summon water, sort of like a like a water bender from the Avatar series. Um, but Kyra can't do that at all. Kyra has the ability to cause bubbles to appear out of the atmosphere. Um, a- actually, out of all of the characters from the D. April's Fools um, book, she is probably this is Kyra over here. She's probably the most powerful of the the quote unquote D list heroes that um, that Bixby and Frederick recruit. She has a better understanding of her power than the other three do, and she never really doubts herself. She definitely needs more training, and um, and she's wise enough to realize that she could benefit from that um but right off the bat she's aware of the fact that even though her power is strange it's powerful so let's head back and we'll look at some other stuff here so arguably one of our most popular pieces of art that we've had done so far was uh paul davies did art for art orcs now we don't have any orcish main characters or anything like that yet but the orcs tell us they're strong they're proud and they're not as savage as they appear in other fantasy worlds and works um you know like even like the the certainly the lord of the rings series and even uh you know in warcraft when you can play as them they're more kind of reserved certainly this guy here looks savage and everything like that but they're uh they're more valiant and honorable than you might uh come to expect from some of those other fantasy universes um and they certainly mark themselves as allies to the goodly races in Telest. So we haven't seen much by way of Orcish heroes just yet, but we will be spending some time with them in the upcoming Quantum Quest novelization. Um, we've got... Let me see if I can dig him up. So we've got a orc named Alaz Leoric, who is this guy here. Big old muscle-bound dude. Big old axe, big old spikes just goes crazy with it um and then we also have a i don't think we have the art for him yet let me see so this is one of the characters that um we worked on with with warren nothing yet it's it's bound to be posted it's already scheduled i just don't have it up on the website yet but um harun jadar is a warden so we've only heard about the wardens briefly but we have seen their shields so way back in the day uh, Azot, one of our other artists, created a, a bit of shield concept art for us. And the Wardens in Telest are um, they're kind of like a, a specialized class of warriors that fight magic users um, by absorbing that magic and ca- casting it back at them. So it's going to be interesting to see Harun. He's a half-orc, so he's got human and orcish lineage, which kind of gets us in the door to understanding that culture a little bit better and a little bit differently. So it is going to be neat to kind of look at that, see what that looks like. Um, And we also had in The Enemy Within, which was the third book in the Legacy series, um, The Child of the Stars, we had Tursek, who was very briefly introduced at the end, and, um, and then we really haven't seen him much yet. He did show up in the Quantum Quest game, so we will see a little bit more of him in other media. And eventually, when we uh, kind of loop back into the greater like Rally region of the world, we might see him again. Uh, we have yet to go to Gengarmar, which is the uh, the Orcish capital within the um, within that area within Rally. But uh, but we'll certainly be visiting there before long. One of the things that we don't really have enough of at all on the Telus website is Minotaur stuff. So we certainly have Minotaurs in the Quantum Quest uh, tie-in game and everything like that. Um, a very prominent one appeared in the short story, which I'm hoping to convert into a novella, uh, Searchlight. Corrin was kind of like your introduction to the story in, in general. 
and she gave us a new glance at what Icarus Kalatawil had been up to, and she also helped to shine a light on what happened to some of the elves of Telus after the fall. But that really didn't give Minotaurs the chance to shine as they should. Um, so thus far, the only place that we really see the Minotaurs, if we go up here and we check them out, the only place that we're going to see them is in the uh, the Quantum Quest stuff. So we'll see. These are some of the ones from the Reinforcements expansion that's coming out soon. So we've got, you know, these characters. Londi is one of the coolest looking Minotaurs I've ever seen. Um, Frieza is kind of how I imagine Corrin looks a little bit. She's got like that that white uh, hair, you know, pale look, things like that. But we also have other cool Minotaurs like Nerala. And then in our original set, uh, one of my favorites is um, uh, Letty Lonvo, who, when she ends up, um, when something happens to her, it ends up causing everything to go wrong. So we had some cool stuff there. Um, but yeah, the Minotaurs, they just really haven't had a chance to shine yet. We talked about them a lot in D. April's Fools. We mentioned it earlier. Um, they ended up getting driven into the sea, and that was kind of, that was it for most of the Minotaurs in Black Lane. They did end up kind of finding um, a, a new place to live in Kalados, which is the kind of second capital of Daltane, which is the place that um, Adelia Cregan's story takes place in with Gaston and Lucinda and stuff like that. Kalados is uh, where you see this sigil right here. Um, so we haven't been to Kalados the same way we haven't been to Gengarmar, but in time, I'm sure that we are going to visit a place like that. The other thing, too, is we have from like the olden days, when I first wrote a foreword for Tellust, we talked about Thundar Proudfist, and he is a minotaur from Lustra who kind of ascended one of the world's tallest mountains. We're definitely going to be taking some time to see a little bit more of him in the future. Um, I don't know if it'll be a short story or if it'll be a novella. Um, his story isn't quite like a lot of the stories that we see because it's kind of going to be like that man versus nature kind of aspect instead of, you know, man versus man or anything like that. It's uh, it's a personal journey and I want to be able to, to do it justice. And that means kind of sitting on it until it, I feel like I can tell it the right way. So let's move on from Minotaurs. And next we'll talk about the Kaja. So we've got some very prevalent Kaja stuff here. Um, arguably one of our coolest characters is Kayonani. She's a dragon speaker from the continent of Savion. She hails from the Kahara Desert. Um, the Kaja, they're skittish but curious, kind of like a cat would be. So um, though they're meant to be on friendly terms with the goodly races and their history... They've had some trouble with some of the other anthropomorphic races of the world, including the kobolds. Some of that is them kind of getting a little bit of confusion between kobolds and gnolls. They're, I mean, they're close enough where the Kaja don't really trust any one of them. Um, but give enough time to a uh, Kaja, uh, you know, let them live alongside or make friends with kobolds, and they'll be able to kind of squash that beef. Um, another famous Kaja that we have is Feypabi. She also uh, shows up in the Quantum Quest novelization. Let me see if I can snag that real quick. Actually, real quick while we're doing that, we'll look at this awesome picture of Kayanani uh, atop her uh, her dragon companion, Talaris. So let's see if we can see Feypabi. Feypabi is one of the older Quantum Quest characters that we have. Um, she also uh, showed up in a short story uh, called The Return of Faith, and we were we were lucky enough that she ended up getting uh, some extra support from one of our backers, Trevor A. Ramirez, who ended up having mm -hmm. us give her kind of a an upgrade from her little pixel version that Sergey made, and Hozier gave us this this boosted version of her. But let's see. There's also one of the things that I wanted to show you was when we were developing Quantum Quest. This was our original look at Fipavi. So we had another artist entirely other than Sergei, and, uh, and this was what her original look was. She never really used a spear or anything like that. It's just sometimes that's the kind of thing that you run into when you're working with an artist. Um, you know, you tweak some things, you experiment, and things like that. She looks a little bit more savage than, uh, than what we wanted to do. And uh, one of the other things that we had to do was we had to kind of steer away from Feypavi looking like Kayonani. We definitely gave Kayonani as the reference shot, but she wasn't supposed to be 
a one-to-one -one representation. So. so let's move on to the kobolds next. We've got a couple of kobolds that we've seen. Um, let's see, where is the cover art for the littlest kobold? So we'll look at that while I'm talking. So kobolds, they're also anthropomorphic uh, races. They're, um, they're canines. And they're perhaps the most varied race on Tell, second to only the trolls, if the trolls in fact beat them. Um, the kobolds, they have a caste-like system that starts based on their pedigree, and then they consider their size as well. So the way that that typically works is if you're a mutt in the kobold world, nobody cares about your opinion. Nobody, you don't get a vote, anything like that. Um, the... The kobolds of Telus definitely think that only pure bloods really matter in their and they're not necessarily their society, but like in governmental structure and things like that. Um, and and after that, it's the size. So if you were kind of like a, a great dame like kobold, your opinion is going to be a lot more important than a Chihuahua kobold. Don't tell that to to Zelda and Maisie. They don't need to know that Luna is considered more important than them. Uh, but uh, it's one of those things where mutts are the best, though. We have nothing but mutts, so it doesn't matter. None of the three of them would have anything, you know, a any votes or anything like that in the uh, Telus universe if they were walking around entirely on their hind feet. Um, so notable kobolds include uh, Leah Tremaine, who you see here. She's uh, the littlest kobold. This is her a little bit older. Um, she uh, ended up being rescued by the Destrite family. We're going to see a little bit more of them in the future and Leah as well. Uh, we also had Pamir, who was another character who was with um, Feypavi, who we just saw in the, the Kaja group, and Vaya Moot, who I don't know. I think we have something extra for Vaya. So I think somebody paid for her to be upgraded as well. Let me see if I can find her real quick. I'm like... Almost positive that Hozier did a version of Maya. Mm, let's go digging for her. Vaya is interesting in that she is one of the characters that I can say she and he and both would be right. Um, we've seen her interpreted in a couple of different ways. Um, her story has her doing some funky magic stuff and it ends up being kind of like a, a story about she, I mean, she's a weird character for sure, but she's got some very cool stuff that she can do uh, as far as her warlock magic that does some interesting things for her. Um, she shows up in the quantum quest novelization, not really too prominent. Um, she's one of the, the characters that shows up towards the end. Um, but still does some pretty interesting things. You can see on the TELUS website, uh, one of the things that we've got here is a bonus scene for people who um, they can kind of dive a little bit deeper into the backstories of our characters once the Quantum Quest novelization comes out and uh, and just see a little bit extra that maybe you wouldn't see in the, in the regular story. And one of the other things about Vaya 2 is uh, amongst everything else that's going on with her that's really crazy, there's some rumors that she's got some null uh, history as well. So, But let's step back into the art gallery. We're going to talk about Avarians next. So Avarians are the bird folk race of Talos. They're not quite like the harpies, which you'll see here. Um, let's see. I know we have Avarians here got a couple of the variants here and we have some stuff here and we'll go to Lord of Thunder because that's where our most prevalent a variant came from so Kyoto is pretty much the first big character that Bolt Thunder Fury meets in Lord of Thunder he's really the driving force for everything um, whereas the the first story is a little bit more personal for Bolt um, the second one kind of establishes him as a hero in, in his own right and introduces everybody to the Avarians. Uh, Kyoto is an Avarian from the Airy, which is kind of far to the northeast in the mountains. And, um, and he was really our first look at these cool bird folk. Um, a lot of them were inspired by uh, the bird folk from Shining Force. So you'll see a lot of that kind of look here. Um, across the way, we've found a couple of other ways to kind of bring them to life in some cool ways. So we see Kyoto and his sister Kiri here. Kiri is supposed to have her own story later on. We haven't had a lot of an opportunity to explore that yet. Um, 
there's just not enough time in the day. I don't have enough personal bandwidth. But we will be looking at that a little bit more. Um, and then we also have this concept piece that Luigi IX did for us. Uh, this is not supposed to necessarily be Kyoto. It looks very similar. But this was just supposed to be kind of a glimpse at what the Avarians could look like. Um, so we've got this here. And then one of the other characters who we'll have to tell a story about in the future. I think she's going to first show up in a comic series. Is This is Kazuri. Um, she is from the Numasa region, and there's a, a whole group that I want to introduce at some point, but uh, I just haven't had the opportunity yet amongst all the other things that we're working on to get that done. But And then the last thing that we're, we'll talk about is um, I, I actually think that what we'll do, just because it is really hot up here, what I'll probably do is we'll split this... Um, we'll split this Talking Telest in two. We'll do the goodly races and we'll do the evil races and then we'll look at the evil races later um but with this last one we're going to be wrapping up the quote-unquote goodly races and that is we're going to be looking at the werebears so um they were first introduced as as far as you know the the written books and everything they were introduced in transformed and in heart of the forest um obviously lycothr lycanthropic bears um and notable members of this race include um, Orson Blythe, who was the apothecary from Transformed, and Urson from Heart of the Forest. And prior to me writing my notes for this show today, I had no idea how much I pulled a George Martin to name these characters so similarly. So that was a fun little thing. Uh, Luigi IX also gave me these awesome looks at these werebears. And uh, one of the things that we did back in the day, I don't know if it's going to be easy to find, but you deserve it for listening to me talk all this time let's see if we got them oh, I don't know that we're going to have them nope we must have hit it we had a, uh, a thing called beware bears hey, let me see give me one second let me play around for one second and see if I can dig that up it's probably hidden but I can still find it Do, do, do. So this was a little April Fool's joke that we pulled. <laughs> really goofy stuff. I didn't do much. Just like clip art and things like that. But I thought it was funny at the time. Um, I, I, it's As with everything April Fool's related when it comes to Telest, there's no guarantee that this doesn't become real in due time. So we'll see what happens there. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to do. Give me one second. So I did want to, to also say thank you a couple of times in this video. First, I wanted to thank the, uh, the folks who joined this, um, you know, who followed me when I was off stream. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate you getting us closer and closer to 25. Once we get to 25, I'm going to show a couple of previews of what we're going to expect when we get to 50. One of them relates to Quantum Quest and how we're going to integrate that with our followers. And the second thing is... We're almost halfway there to 50 to affiliate. I will be showing off the emotes that you can expect to see. So we'll do that. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to say thank you for was um, last week, uh, Wild Magic got to, let me see, I think. All right, I'm going to try and go to, no, I won't. It's going to end up dropping out the microphone. I don't want to do that. Um, Wild Magic was the 20th book that I wrote. It was released last week. Um, let me just go to, I don't even have it up on the website yet. I'm a terrible person when it comes to self-promotion, but so wild magic ended up, um, going live last week. We already got our first five-star review. I was very happy to see that. Um, a big thanks to Christy for putting that up. Um, but the other awesome thing, and we'll see if the numbers are still as good as they are. Mageborn was promoted earlier this morning. And look at that. We got to number one in two categories and number two in the third. That is just the coolest thing that I've seen in a long, long time. Um, Mageborn used to routinely be in, like, the top 20. So I'm very excited to see that way up there. Huzzah, indeed. Um, I'm just I'm flabbergasted that, like, even after all these years, Mageborn can still climb to the top of the list. It's, um, it's a very good story, if I do say so myself. Um, but it's an old story, and uh, and to see it get so much love 
is one of those things that I'm very much appreciative for. Um, so let's see, what else can we talk about when it comes to races? Rihanna, did you have any questions about uh, the races it tells that I didn't mention or anything like that yet? And again, we will hit the 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 quote unquote evil races at another time. Um, you know, we'll 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 go that route. You know what? One of the other things that we could talk about is I wonder do we have any of that stuff in the art gallery? Our D and D characters. Because all of our D and D characters are represented by the the goodly races. Did I not throw them up here? Huh. Well, let's see if we can't stalk them out. Thinking of a bunch, but I guess they're evil. Well, I mean, we know that Anaria is not evil. So we've got our Kaja Anaria. We've got our dwarf Pickledorf. Here we go. We got some of this stuff that we can look at. Yeah, our werewolf isn't evil. I don't know that I would necessarily call um, Dirk a race. He's the only werewolf that we know so far. Uh, I'm sure that there are other werewolves in the Telus universe. We know that in the um, in the D&D sessions that we played that there's were-rats, so it doesn't really you know, make a lot of sense to kind of throw him out in the cold or anything like that. But, you know, we've got a little tiny mix of characters. So we've got the two dwarves. We've got the... We originally had two Kaja. Um, and we, of course, have our, our orc shaman. Um, so we have a, a nice little mix. And we had this little bonus thing that we put together. We originally had another human and another Kaja, but we ended up missing uh, both of them. They, uh, they dropped out of our party just because of other commitments and just not being able to show up and things like that. Um, anyway, so yeah, just some pretty cool looks at our characters and things like that. And, uh, and we'll be playing around with that more in the future for sure. Yeah, I think that'll, that'll probably wrap us up. I don't have to do any sponsorships today or anything like that. So, um, I'll leave the, let's head over to the chat real quick and see, I'm not too sweaty up here today. Um, We'll leave this for a minute or two, and then we will end up dropping this over to the closing the show. I'll talk a little bit about that kind of stuff, and um, and yeah, we'll just we'll see what we can come up with from there. Um, Brianna, any last questions that you might have for me or anything? I know you have an important one to ask me for sure. I would love a chalky milk. Let's see. Are you going to play nice? All right. I am going to go to the show closing page, and uh, and we'll wrap this up. Like I said, I will hit the other races of Tells later. Uh, and it, by the way, this is by no means a list of all the races. There's uh, plenty of other races that we'll see uh, within the Tells universe over time. This is just what we're starting with. So um, we'll hit you up with more like that later. But let's cut over to the show closing page and folks i wanted to thank you for watching my stream today on the screen now you should see all the places that you can find telest and that's entertainment content to find anything out about the telest fantasy universe you can go to telest.com for the battle maps that my brother and i create you can go to patreon.com slash telest i just posted my 30th map well our 30th map on patreon today um it extends versalia rye to our third map in that zone um and it connects it really neatly there's like 44 plus buildings in that zone so uh, i'm very proud of that little area of the the world um to see my streams live you can of course see me here on twitch.tv slash that telest guy to see all the streams that I've ever done for maps and talking Telus like this, you can check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at world of For our video game related content, you can go to that's, that entertains.com or the That's Entertainment YouTube, youtube.com slash at That's Entertainment Games. And to find all of our awesome merchandise, including high quality mouse pads, handcrafted magic wands, battle maps, posters like posters of our awesome uh races and our characters and everything like that you can head over to our shop at etsy.com slash shop slash tellist so that's awesome thank you very much and uh if you need anything else if you have any other questions you can feel free to join us next time and ask us questions about the world of tellist thank you very much 